Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first um, session of our webinar cycle, Franco-American Thursdays ahead of the midterms. Here at Institut Montaigne, we are very grateful to Colombia, both its Alliance program and its Paris Global Center, who are partnering up with us and helping us launch these timely projects aimed at bringing together experts from both sides of the Atlantic a short month before the midterms. So as we all know, the US will hold its election on November 8th, which will define the political makeup of Congress. If Republicans win, they could thwart Biden's legislative agenda for the second half of his term. This crucial political context, coupled with a particularly unstable international one, made it essential for us to create this space of discussion. So we wanted a forum of exchange to discuss and shed light on the main topics underlying the electoral campaign, which find resonance in France and Europe, obviously. So this cycle will be composed of four one-hour-long sessions, which will bring a Franco-American perspective to the following topics. So the economy first, and that's our subject today. Then the state of transatlantic relations in the context of the Russo ukrainian war, and then the unveiling of the climate urgency against the backdrop of an international energy crisis. A conclusive session will finally provide an analysis of the midterm results and their implications for the bilateral relationship between both of our country. So for this first session, our focus is on the economy, an issue at the heart of American concerns for a week away from the election, but which is also fundamental in France and Europe, and in France in particular, um, where the state budget for 2023 is about to be voted on. So to bring an expert eye to this critical subject, we are extremely honored to welcome this morning, well, or the afternoon, depending where you are, Institut Montaigne's economic advisor, Eric Chanet, and Pierre-André Capori, economics professor at Columbia. So they will discuss from their respective French slash European and American perspectives, inflation, energy prices, rising wages, and recession risks, along with matter of innovation and the return of economic growth. So Eric just wrote a piece for Institut Montaigne on the return of systematic risk in Europe, which will be very useful for our discussion. So I won't be too long. We will start with France for, and Europe for 10, 15 minutes, and then the US for the same time. And then we're gonna start the discussion between our two experts. Please, participants, do feel free to directly ask questions in the chat box. Any comments or remarks are really welcome. And I will then forward these to our two panelists. So to begin, Eric, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blanche. Thank you to Colombia and Estinto Montaigne. I think this is going to be quite exciting. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of points about where we are in the euro area in terms of the economic situation, uh, policy reactions, and, and maybe uh, a couple of points on, on the risks that you have mentioned. And uh, uh, I will also try to give some colors about the French economy and French economic policy. Um, the, the, the current situation is extremely strange, weird. When, when you listen to uh, companies or to consumers via the business surveys, they are just starting to be a bit worried by economic events, which are big, of course, because there is a, a massive supply side shock, and I will come back to this. Uh, economists are absolutely convinced. Uh, you know, you have always the optimistic guys and the pessimistic guys. But everybody shares the view that given the size of the supply side shock, which is a shortage of uh, energy, whether it is uh, natural gas or fossil gas or uh, power supply, when, when there is less energy, <laughs> there will be less output. So uh, economists are convinced that there will be a significant recession, probably in the fourth quarter, first quarter of next year, maybe with a tail. Uh, that the recession will be, uh, of course, different given the exposure of um, the different economies to uh, Russian gas. For instance, the Eastern European countries will be hit harder. Germany will be hit, hit harder than France. Italy will be hit harder than France. And Spain will be hit less than, than France. Okay, but basically, there is a big supply side shock. And it's not yet, neither in um, consumer sentiment, not even in business sentiment. This morning I was uh, 
with uh, the CEO of a big uh, French bank. And he said that he was extremely surprised that companies, in, including you know, SMEs, are still uh, asking for credit for their investments as if nothing was happening. Okay, so that's the paradox. But nevertheless, the shock is already here. Uh, I was mentioning uh, the nature of the shock. It's a big supply side shock. Just to put some numbers on that, spending on energy has risen to above 10% of GDP. And it was 5% of GDP before uh, the, the, the rise in uh, energy prices. And this is slightly higher than it was after the second oil shock in 1979. So we are really talking about a, a huge, a, a large scale supply side shock. Uh, this has already translated in much higher inflation than it used to be. I just give you some numbers because they are in, they are important. Nine percent, nine point one percent for the euro area in August, but that goes from twenty five percent for Estonia, which is highly dependent on, on Russian gas, to six point six percent for France. France being at the bottom of the scale uh, because of uh, the, the decisions taken by the government, fiscal policy supposed to shelter households from uh, the price shock. Uh, but in Germany, it's quite significant. It's 9%. That reminds me the consequences of the German unification. Big difference being that this time it's a supply side shock, whereas in uh, 89, 90, that was a demand side shock. Um, it's interesting to see that at the beginning, a lot of people were saying, you know, inflation is different in Europe than it is in the US. In the US, it's a, well, you know, Pierre André will talk about that, but it's it's broad, broadly based. It's not only energy. Whereas in Europe, it's mostly energy. Maybe that was true six months ago, but now X energy inflation is at six point at 5.5%. And I've just checked because we know that as a consequence of uh, the recovery post COVID, there is a stronger demand for goods than for services. For goods, X energy, we are at 6%. So maybe this is due to uh, stronger than usual demand, but it's quite significant. But for services, we are close to 4%. And this is, this is uh, in my view, some indirect evidence that wages have started to accelerate. According to Eurostat, uh, wage costs were uh, growing at 4.4%. At the end of the world well, in the second quarter we have only quarterly data unfortunately for that and uh, that's for the euro area and probably wages are still accelerating um, they, they are now uh, unions are asking for higher wages to compensate for the rise of the cost of living and this is true in france but this is true in a lot of, of european countries in spain in particular so we should expect inflation to become a bit more endogenous uh, because uh, wages have, uh, are starting to follow. Now, the, the, the second paradox of this recession, which might explain this kind of, I wouldn't say feel good factor because you know there is a war uh, at, at the doors of the European Union. It's a not feel bad factor. Well, when you go into a recession, you know that the unemployment rate is likely to rise. Uh, you have uh, you know, a drop in confidence. I, let's call that a feel bad factor. We don't have this feel bad factor. And the explanation might be the very high level of savings that were accumulated uh, during the COVID crisis. I mean, the numbers are, are quite interesting. For the euro area as a whole, the personal savings rate stands at 15% of disposable income. It was 13%, 12 to 13% of disposable income before the crisis. So people are still living with a good mattress of savings. Of course, given the rise of inflation, uh, this has already been eroded by the rise of, of prices, but we, we know that most people are more sensitive to nominal variables, as we say, as economists. So they look at their bank account and they say, it's okay, it's okay. I have much more money than I used to have. And this is not only for the rich people, this is true almost all uh, through um, the, 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 the income distribution. So this excess of savings will be even reinforced by the massive fiscal stimuluses. Well, they are, they are not designed as stimuluses. They are designed as shields against the rise of uh, the cost of living. The, the numbers are, are just enormous. I mean, there was an estimate made 
uh, when we, we had recent announcements in the UK, which is not in the European Union, but nevertheless, it's a European country, uh, announcements in Germany, which have followed announcements in France, which came earlier. Now we have the, the budget, the draft budget law in France, but the numbers are absolutely enormous. Germany uh, is uh, going to spend 8% of GDP, eight, uh, to protect consumers and companies, especially SMEs, against the price of energy shock. In the UK, it is 6%. In France, it is around 4% of GDP. So we are talking about massive fiscal expenditure to protect people uh, against the rise of, uh, of energy prices and their consequences on other items. Will that prevent the recession? Absolutely not, because a fiscal decision so to protect people uh, from the, the rise of inflation does not produce natural gas or power. So uh, the supply side shock is still here. So the paradox is that we are going to have a deep recession in some, in some constituencies, probably not as deep in France that is going to be in Germany, uh, but people will be protected. <laughs> they will not probably lose their jobs if companies uh, are kept afloat by government spending. So this is, I think, something relatively unprecedented, which justifies, you know, the word war economy. I mean, this is really something that uh, we, we are, well, this is not so different from what happened during the COVID um, crisis and all the lockdowns. So we are still in the same spirit, governments are here to protect people. We cannot prevent the recession, but we keep you protected. Of course, the consequence is there will be another big rise in government debt everywhere in the uh, European Union and in the Euro area. Uh, I, I want to, to make a point about the French economy. So, okay, inflation is much lower. Well, 6.6% is not nothing, but it's much lower than in Germany. In the Netherlands, we're at 14%. And the reason is this uh, uh, tariff shield. Government decided that electricity prices would not rise by more than 4%. And of course, since uh, electricity has jumped by 50%, that means that the government has to, to bridge the gap. Okay, so this is, this is fiscal spending to keep inflation low. And this has been usually criticized by economists, and I, I was the first to, to say that. I mean, if you do not convey the price signal, people will not cut their spending on energy. So uh, the adjustment will have to be through the quantities. You will have to ration. You, you will have to, uh, to take decisions to cut, you know, not spending but to cut the use of power supply or natural gas, because you do not want the price signal to be conveyed to people. But there is a reason why the French government did that, and I want to stress it. It is a particularity of the French economy, which is also true uh, in Belgium and to some extent in Italy. It is the very strong link between inflation of the CPI and wages through the indexation of the minimum wage, which is more than indexation, minimum wage uh, by status, by law, increases more than inflation. And so this is a country where wage rigidity, despite a lot of reforms in the labor market, remains higher than uh, most of its neighbors. And we are in the same currency area. By definition, there is no way to regain competitiveness by devaluation. So the idea of this, uh, of this shield, uh, inflation shield or shield against inflation in France was also to minimize the wage price loop that would be triggered by the automatic rise of the minimum wage and of low wages in general. So, that, you know, there is a there was a silver lining in this decision. So it's, it's very costly in terms of budget. It is unfair because it protects uh, uh, everyone, whereas it's only the low income families that uh, would need to be protected. But it has a macroeconomic reason, which is to avoid, uh, let's say, something like a wage price loop that would lead to sustained inflation in France and would lead to a loss of competitiveness compared to Germany, Italy, uh, or, or uh, the neighboring countries. So that, that's, um, I close here on, on the French case. Now, in terms of uh, policy reactions, I've already mentioned 
um, the, the, the fiscal uh, policy reaction. So the, these shields everywhere in Europe. Uh, th there is something that is a bit disappointing, uh, which is that it, it, it is still extremely difficult for Euro or for European Union countries to agree on a common energy policy. And uh, you know there, there are uh, countries which have uh, decided to take their own way to do the, it's uh, to do it their own way. This is the case of Spain. Germany is is uh, is uh, pursuing a very strange policy, which is uh, um, to uh, produce more power uh, thanks to coal-powered uh, 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 plants. But since in the European Union there is a net change trading system with quota. If the German industry takes more quota, that leads to a higher carbon price, which implies that the other participants in the ETS will have less access to the carbon quota. So this is a, you know, a kind of, a, we, we are not really in a cooperative framework between, between countries. Each country is trying to do its best to protect its own consumers, but its own industry as well. And this is not, uh, certainly not, um, you know, a good equilibrium. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly not a cooperative equilibrium. Last thing on the policy reactions, monetary policy. So this is very different uh, in the euro area than it was in the US. For, for long, the ECB considered that, uh, you know, monetary policy cannot produce oil, gas, or, uh, or power. So uh, since it is a supply side shock, you just have to look through the shock and wait until um, it, it, it goes away. And then inflation started to creep up, even non-energy inflation, even in services, as I have mentioned. And the Fed took the decisions after having waited maybe too long. So the ECB had to follow suit. Because if you think of it, uh, the Fed reaction, which is very strong, leads to an appreciation of the US dollar, which is a way, even though it is not the design, to export US inflation to other constituencies. And the euro area, of course, is one of these constituencies. The US is a big trade partner. So the ECB has to follow. For domestic reasons, inflation is becoming more entrenched than uh, the Monetary Policy Council thought it would be. And second, there is this imported inflation through the exchange rate. Uh, which is something that monetary policy can deal with. So the conclusion in terms of monetary policy is that, um, well, the ECB will continue to raise rates, but I give you my, my feeling, and my feeling is that as soon as there are concrete signs of recession, so that when, when you see the hard data showing that we are in recession, the ECB will not be able to raise rates more. In terms of uh, its, uh, its balance sheet, so quantitative policy, there will be no quantitative tightening in the euro area. And as we all know, the, the ECB has a constraint, which is that monetary policy has consequences on the fiscal sustainability of individual countries in the euro area. And here, of course, as usual, the big case is Italy. So there are no elections in Italy, but there were elections in Italy. And the markets did not really like the result. So that was there was no panic at all. But in terms of uh, bond yields, the spread vis-a-vis -vis Germany has increased quite significantly, and the budget is still unknown. So maybe we will have a test, like we had in the UK after uh, the the Chancellor announced a fiscal policy, which was. Uh, well, I would say uh, extremely surprising, a big stimulus with 10% inflation. So the, the bond market in the UK immediately rose its hand saying this is insane. And the government had to backtrap and the Bank of England had to buy gilts. So maybe we are going to have such a test in the euro area, depending on the uh, Italian budget. I'm not going to make any uh, speculation on that. We had a lot of discussions within the Institut Montaigne showing that this coalition in Italy uh, might be more reasonable in terms of fiscal policy, not because it likes that, but because of the constraints coming from the ECB, from the partners and from the markets. Now, just a word on the financial risks. Uh, one point which is very often mentioned is government debt, which has increased quite a lot in most countries, well, not in most, in all countries, as a consequence of the COVID crisis. So you subsidize people, whereas they don't work. And this is going to increase even more. 
with uh, the energy crisis. Uh, one point that is, I'm afraid, overlooked is the big rise in the previous years, in the last 10 years, of the private sector debt, mostly coming from the corporate side. I just give you a couple of numbers because I have that on my spreadsheet. For the euro area, the private sector debt as a percentage of GDP, so these are the BIS numbers, 170% of GDP. For France, 230% of GDP. It's a bit lower than the peak, which was 240% of GDP. And as I said, this is mostly corporate debt. So in the euro area, where uh, quantitative easing was massive with negative interest rates, bond yields, 10-year bond yields, were negative at some point, in, not everywhere, but in many countries, uh, the consequence is a big rise in corporate debt. And that is, uh, I think, one of the financial risks, which is due to the fact that bond yields have started to increase, and not only nominal bond yields, but also real bond yields, if you look at the uh, inflation-protected bond market. So we, we are entering uh, very choppy waters with this very strange recession. I call that third type recession, supply side caused recession, but with a big support on income coming from past actions of governments and their current action. And in a context of very high private sector debt, this is not mortgage debt. The mortgage debt is very toxic as we all know. Uh, this is more corporate debt. So this might have consequences on uh, the balance sheets of the banks as we, you know, the euro area is mostly intermediated. Uh, two thirds of the funding of the economy is coming from bank loans and one third from the markets. So uh, if there are difficulties, if uh, we start to see bankruptcies, uh, and that might be one of the reasons why government want to avoid that, uh, then there might be a kind of vicious circle uh, by which banks would suffer from uh, what happens in the corporate side as a consequence of the rise of bond yields. And when banks are less profitable, they lend less to the economy, which uh, might impair the recovery post uh, energy crisis. When I say post energy crisis, uh, maybe this is something I should avoid to say because nobody knows exactly how long it will take to get back to a more normal situation. If I listen to uh, people more specialized on energy than I am, they are talking about two or three years. So the choppy waters are, I'm afraid, here to stay for quite a while. Well, thank you very much, Eric, for this um, very complete uh, presentation. Now, turning to the United States, are we witnessing similar shocks and risks in the country? And are we witnessing the same situation of denial uh, of the economic actors as uh, Eric just described at the beginning of his intervention? Uh, are there any paradox as we can observe uh, in Europe and France? For sure, uh, the responses of the states, the monetary policies are really different in the US. And we're really curious to hear more about this. So now Pierre-André, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. So thank you to Eric for a very comprehensive uh, and very deep analysis of the of the European, European case. Uh, as you said, uh, the situation in the US was apparently similar, but in fact, uh, quite different. Although, as you also say, the difference might be might, might be uh, less now than, than what it used to be. So why? First of all, let's, let's look at inflation. Uh, inflation was, was different for, uh, for several reasons. The first reason is, as, as you mentioned, uh, in Europe, the inflation was essentially due to energy prices. Uh, that was not the case in the US, much less the case. Uh, in, the, uh, in the US, the, the main determinant was you know, standard inflation theory, too much money uh, chasing after uh, too few uh, commodities. Uh, so the, the, the shock actually, uh, even before the energy shock, there was the pandemic related shock with all the disruption to international trade and so on. So we've seen that the, the supply side has, has been depressed for completely exogenous reasons. On the other hand, there has been those very strong, very, uh, massive intervention from the government. And that's not only Biden, that, that started with Trump. Uh, so as a result, households have, 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 are sitting on a cushion that, that could be that more than $1 trillion. Uh, so we have this 
very uh, strong increase actually in, in purchasing power, the, the very striking fact in the US so that if you look at the COVID crisis, if anything, at the end of the crisis, the, the average wealth of the household was slightly larger than what, what it used to be before. On the other hand, you, you have a, a, a supply shock that started with the COVID and that has been, of course, um, amplified by, by the energy. So it was more like a standard inflation. That's that, that the first difference. And the second difference is that, as you also mentioned, uh, the, the US can export part of their inflation because of the dollar. Now, one thing is the, 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 the Fed, the US Central Bank, uh, started to fight the is, uh, increasing rates earlier than the European Central Bank, and the increase so far has been more important on the Fed side. Uh, there, so this mechanically increases the value of the currency. Uh, in addition, uh, there, is, there is this kind of uh, general concern, if, if not, uh, not yet a panic, but this kind of anxiety about the, uh, the, the future of the economies. And people in periods of anxiety tend to move to, to what's safe, and the dollar is perceived as, as, a, as a safe currency. So there's been this, this very significant increase in the, in the dollar. Now, what, so part of, part of, the, uh, of, of the consequence has been exporting the inflation to other countries. Uh, incidentally, there is something that's well known uh, at the international macro level, which is that when people react to, um, to inflation, uh, there are some kind of externalities because if uh, the, um, if the if the the Fed the U.S. Central Bank when when the Fed increased the rates it has a cooling effect on the U.S. economy which is exactly what they want it also has a cooling effect on the other economies through the the, the mechanism we just described and this is not taken into account so we 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 might be in a game in which everybody is doing a bit too much because everybody is not taking into account the consequences on the, on other countries. Now, uh, so the, the inflation used to be different. It's, it might be less different now than, it, than, than used to be the case. Uh, and exactly for the reason that, that you mentioned, which is uh, wages. So in any country, that, that's, uh, there is this concern of the spiral, that uh, wage increase as a, uh, sorry, uh, prices increases as a result. Workers are asking for higher wages, and uh, but firms are willing to give those higher wages because they expect that they can increase their prices and so on and so forth. And and then inflation becomes entrenched. And actually, the the main discussion in the U.S. is uh, it and inflation doesn't seem to be entrenched now as as far as we can measure it in the sense that if you look at expected inflation and you could you could ask people or you could look look at the value of, uh, of uh, financial product, uh, it doesn't seem to be the case that people expect an acceleration of inflation in the next future. But expectations are volatile and this could change. And this is obviously the main driving force of the Fed. Uh, the Fed is, uh, is very concerned about uh, killing the inflation before it becomes entrenched with all the, the consequences for the US economy, but also for the other economies. Regarding recession, so uh, their recession will probably not be as severe in the US as in, the, in, the, in Europe, in particular in some European countries. Uh, one reason being, as you mentioned, that the US are much less dependent on, on energy. Uh, than actually their, their, their dependency is very, is very small than, than other countries. Uh, actually, the situation reminds me a little bit of the, the oil shock in 74. Uh, the oil shock was a big tax that was levied on, on, uh, on the Western economies, uh, and the, but the tax was paid to, uh, to outside, to, it was paid to um, the, the producing countries. Uh, now there is there is also the shock on energy, but in the U.S. It's, it remains mostly internal. So we don't have this kind of levy that's taken out of the economy. Uh, now actually, there there is an interesting discussion, an interesting discussion in the U.S. right now about are we in a recession? Uh, as as you know, uh, there is no in the U.S. There is no mechanical definition of recession as you know two quarters of uh, shrinking GDP or anything like this. There is a, a committee at the at the NBER which is uh, analyzing the data and and 
and uh, they are they are in charge of deciding whether or not we're in a recession. Now, their task is sort of complex because GDP on the one hand and the labor market on the other hand are, uh, are giving very different signals. Uh, if you look at the labor market in the US, it's, it has been until recently performing quite well. Uh, employment has been uh, increasing. We didn't see the, uh, any kind of massive increase in unemployment. Uh, I, I tend to believe that employment is more reliable than unemployment because the distinction between uh, unemployment and inactivity is, is not clear and, and is fluctuating, but definitely employment has been, has been doing well. One indicator that people look at a lot is voluntary quits, people who quit their job. Uh, the idea being that you don't quit your job unless you think that the, the, the labor market is good enough so that you will be able to, uh, to find a new job quite easily. And what we see is that the, this kind of indicator until recently was, was, was sort of optimistic. So I don't think we're gonna, we're gonna avoid a recession. Uh, the, the, central, the, the bite of the central bank decision have, has only started. Uh, the, the diffusion of the higher rates to the economy uh, they were just at the beginning, plus the central bank will, will continue. And uh, it's very clear that the Fed is very serious about maintaining its, um, its uh, credibility. Now, uh, so uh, one thing that I should add about the US, which is uh, very specific, specifically American, uh, which is something that uh, Blanche alluded to at the beginning, is the prospect of the midterm election, which will be in the next month. Uh, and uh, so God knows what will happen, but uh, apparently the, the, the likeliest scenario is a scenario in which the, the Democrats keep the Senate, maybe slightly increase their majority at the Senate, but they lose the House. What, the, what will the consequence be? Well, essentially, uh, what, what we see is uh, a gridlock that will look a lot like the situation in the last uh, two years of uh, Obama mandate. You know, when, when uh, Obama was, was the president during the last two years, there was this kind of, of gridlock. It's, it's sort of interesting, by the way, if you look at, the, at US history, uh, situation in which the, 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 the power was shared in the sense that the president was on one side and the Congress was on the other side, they used to be pretty, pretty good. Uh, essentially because that was a situation in which it was obvious for everyone that bipartisan kind of initiatives were needed. And there was this kind of strong incentive. And at the end of the day, people were, were, fi were, were uh, finding compromises. And the kind of legislation that was adopted in this kind of situation used to be good, uh, except that now it's no longer the case. Now, now we have this complete polarization. And, uh, and uh, essentially, we've seen what the Republicans could do uh, without the majority in the House, without the majority at the Senate, but just using the filibuster. And, and, and uh, so this kind of, of gridlock can, always, can only become worse if, uh, if in addition, they, they take the House. So there is this very strong, uh, this very strong constraint, which explains some policies that, that are very surprising. For instance, uh, you, you might have seen that Biden has decided to uh, cancel or, or reduce the debt of, uh, of students. We're talking about huge amounts, right? We're talking about 400 billions. Uh, and it might not be, I mean, economists agree on the fact that it might not be the best way to help poor people if only because if you, if you look at poor people, they, they don't have much uh, university debt because they don't go to university. Uh, but one of the reasons why Biden did that is that it was something that he could do without uh, needing uh, uh, the, 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 Senate, the Senate to approve and without facing the kind of, uh, of deadlock that, that uh, we had before. Now, two points. Uh, first of all, financial risk. Um, it's less acute in the US than what Eric described in Europe, but it's there. And we've seen for instance, there was, including during January, uh, during, you know, just before the war, some IPOs uh, that, that, that were undertaken, including massive ones, you know, Citrix and, and, and things like this. Uh, the, those IPOs, essentially, you're buying real, real assets, issuing debt. When the interest rate go up, 
those kind of, of the bank that were funding those IPOs can uh, end up in a very difficult situation. So the, the mechanism that Eric described for the private sector, and especially you're absolutely right on this. It's not, we're not talking about individuals. Individuals are not safe, they have cautions. We're talking about the, the but we're talking about corporate debt and the, and the impact on the banking sector. And this could be quite serious, which is something that the Fed knows actually, but, uh, I don't think that will be sufficient to uh, dissuade the Fed from, from uh, continuing the fight against inflation. Uh, I'm, I'm more worried about uh, the, the European Central Bank, by the way, and what, what you described, which I unfortunately is, is very likely. I mean, I completely share your pessimism about this. The consequence could be that the European Central Bank might lose in uh, within within a couple of years, much of the credibility that it very painfully acquired during during, during all those years of the of the European Union, and in the end, it might it might end up uh, translating into tension on the well, you know, as as, as you say, we, there is no exchange rates within the European Union, so whenever there are the kind the kind of um, macro problem that could otherwise be solved by changes in the exchange rates, now they will they will really affect the the, the survival of, of, the, of the monetary union. And that, that would be, let me just conclude on, on two things. I would just to open a little bit on the, on the long term. The first one is uh, the, the energy crisis hopefully will not last forever, a uh, couple of years, but maybe not more. Oh, uh, we can be, uh, we, we don't know much about the, the war in Ukraine, uh, but in the very long run, the kind of challenge that will remain are obviously climate change. Now, if there is a, an irony in this because, uh, I mean, you, Eric, you remember uh, that five years ago, or even two years ago, economists have been saying for years, actually even for decades, that you want to be serious about climate change, you need a carbon tax or the equivalent or a carbon tax. It could be you know, a market for right with a price that's high enough or whatever. And there was a, this very strong resistance from politicians on the ground that, you know, uh, people don't want to pay. Uh, it's uh, a French politician coined the terms of, uh, we don't want punitive ecology. You remember this punitive ecology stuff. So there was this kind of illusion that we could fight climate at no cost, which of course it's completely false. I mean, uh, just read the, the recent report by Olivier Blanchard and Jean Tirole, they very, uh, strongly emphasize the fact that climate change will be costly, fighting climate change will be costly. And the only reason why we still need to do it is that it's uh, costly as it is now, it's, it's still much less than the cost uh, that it would be uh, 20 or 30 years from now if we don't do anything. Well, the, the irony is now we have a carbon tax. Actually, the price of energy have increased much more than, than, than the, any amount, the reasonable amount for the carbon tax. Uh, and, you know, the economy will probably survive it. Uh, the question, however, is what kind of measures should we use? We all agree on the fact that adopting short-term measure to help people make sense. You, you, it, it, the, the, the impact, if there is no government intervention, the impact uh, on, in particular, on, on the, at the bottom of the, of the income distribution can, can be really dramatic and we don't want that. The question is what kind of, of help can we, can we use? Uh, one thing that works quite well is just giving poor people money. You know, uh, because as, uh, and again, that, that, that's something Eric said, but I think it's crucially important. You don't want to mess with press signals. Uh, the current situation is a situation in which we have a huge supply shock, and that's the reason why the why the prices are going up. If the bottom line is a is a huge supply shock, the last thing you want to do is subsidize demand. And at the end of the day, the kind of measures in which you you either you put a cap or uh, or, or you um, or you subsidize. Uh, the price of uh, gas, oil, whatever, uh, it's, a, it's a subsidy to demand. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's, in a sense, it's exactly what you could not do now. So it might make sense to do it in the short run to avoid some kind of consequences. And in particular, the, the argument that, that Eric was, was putting forth as we want to avoid the indexation and the spiral to kick in is a very strong one. It's a short-term one. In the long run, we're gonna get used to, we, we need to get used to higher energy prices. 
But at the end of the day, that's the only silver lining of the current situation. But I'm confident that the economy will react, that innovation will take place, and that the, the economy five years from now will be much better equipped to face this kind of shock than, than it is now. One last point, if you, if you allow me, uh, talking about innovation. Uh, a friend of mine, Olivier Coste, has, has written a, a booklet. I don't think it's, uh, it's published yet, but a very interesting booklet in which he's comparing innovation uh, and uh, research and development uh, uh, in particular uh, between Europe and the US. And his conclusion is uh, Europe is losing ground. And in particular, Europe is losing ground on what he calls new technology. So if you look at the, the R&D, the research and development expenditures, first of all, uh, the US spend more than France, definitely as a percentage of GDP. But don't only that, if you look at the, the distribution of R&D in France, it's mostly of what could be called mature sectors. It's automobile, it's uh, aircraft, this kind of uh, much less on uh, tech, artificial intelligence, biology. So all the kind of new uh, new sectors that, uh, that have emerged very strongly over the last uh, decade and that likely to, to drive future growth. France and Europe in general are, uh, they are losing ground. And I'm very concerned about the fact that our capacity to innovate in those crucial sectors will be affected in the, in the long term. And uh, this is a very serious uh, issue. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Pierre André, for this presentation. Some of the situation uh, you just described sound really familiar here uh, in France, and particularly this polarization situation in Parliament you just described um, in the beginning of um, your, your speech uh, uh, and before the, the midterms uh, election. We have exactly the same uh, situation in France, this polarization making it highly impossible to find a uh, consensus uh, solution on the economy, uh, notably. But Eric, would you like to react to Pierre André's speech, especially on these two last points, like energy, climate change, innovation? Well, if you give me three minutes, yes, I would like to add a couple of things. And I, I really share, uh, you know, what, what Pierre André said about um, uh, there is a silver lining that we, we have. Uh, without uh, Russian gas, economies will have to adapt to a world with less carbon intensive sources of energy. Uh, but <clears throat> I don't want to pour cold water on that, but uh, you know, I, I wrote a report for Montaigne back in 2019 advocating for a, a, a carbon price policy. It's not necessarily carbon tax because we have uh, a, a cap and trade system, which is, which is not bad by the way. And the, the price of the ton of CO2 uh, uh, rose to 90 euros per ton, which was, uh, you know, uh, something that was not expected by economists, and it was a good piece of news. Now, <clears throat> the point is, uh, the, the yellow jacket movement, uh, this is, is something that had political consequences everywhere, not only in France. Uh, but remember, Joe Biden, uh, at the primary, he had a carbon price or a carbon tax in his initial platform. And probably somebody told him, uh, have you seen the yellow jackets in Paris uh, burning everything? And he removed that. Uh, the consequence in Europe is that the European Commission put forward a plan called Fit for 55, a 55% reduction in uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, compared to 1990 by 2030. Uh, and that was simply to be consistent with the path toward net zero in 2050. And there were a lot of good ideas, such as extending the carbon market to new sectors, such as uh, transportation and heating, which are uh, you know, big sectors in terms of uh, emissions, and uh, other things which uh, I think went in the right direction, including a, a border tax adjustment. And when I look at what happened in the European Parliament, where both the far right and the far left decided to oppose these propositions, the far left saying that it's not enough, the far right saying that it was too much. But the consequence is that uh, Fit for 55, I hope is not dead, but he's very sick. And that's a bad piece of news. So to some extent, maybe Putin is going to help Europe 
to go a bit faster and more seriously toward decarbonization. And uh, to do that, you have to increase the supply of uh, decarbonized uh, power, because of course, electricity is the solution if you want to decarbonize the economy. So we will see whether more uh, capital will be allocated to the production of uh, low or zero carbon energy, but that should be a logical consequence of uh, the fact that there is no more Russian gas for Europe, and which of course will require Germany to overhaul its economy. But I share uh, your optimism because you know we, we have been through big supply side shocks. And I, I bear in mind the fact that economists were surprised uh, to see how the supply side of economies reacted. So oil is more expensive. Now you have new processes, new products, a lot of things which imply a much lower use of oil per unit of GDP. So now it's not oil, it's carbon to some extent because uh, uh, natural gas is, well. so um, <clears throat> some cold water on 555, but I share your view that Putin is helping uh, us to decarbonize our economies. Um, the, the second point on, on innovation, and, and I'm, I'm afraid that, you know, this is, I would really like to see the report that you mentioned uh, but this is so convergent with a lot of other studies. Um, and wh what strikes me is that uh, uh, there, there are a lot of talks about reviving industrial policies in Europe. But when you look at what it means for those who are advocating for industrial policies, it's uh, doing <laughs> things of the past. You know, uh, an Airbus for batteries, there is nothing more stupid than an Airbus for batteries investing in R&D for the next generation of batteries without lithium, for instance, that would be smart. No, but people want to have the same thing as the Chinese. Uh, you, you want to have a, a semiconductor, uh, a chip industry, which is by the way, an extremely volatile uh, uh, sector, which um, is, I'm not sure Europeans would like that, to have a sectors where you have booms and bursts, where you have, to fire people. But again, it's fighting the last battle. And Europe is not investing enough in R&D, including basic research. OK, we are very happy of the Nobel Prizes in physics, not only because Anna Aspe got one, but you know that there were two Europeans. Um, that's, that's great, but that's, I'm afraid to say, that's the old generation. So we are very proud of that. That's good. But the European Research Council, which is funding basic research in Europe and the best of basic research, which has, by the way, funded the work of a lot of future Nobel Prizes, is able to fund basic research for 2 billion euros per year. This is just crazy, 2 billion euros. It's trifle. And the governments are going to spend 500 billion US dollars to protect consumers against the rise in prices because they are scared by yellow jackets. So to some extent, we are working on our heads in Europe. Okay, maybe I'm a bit too pessimistic, but uh, this is, I think the point that you make is extremely important because it is the long term. And as far as France is concerned, and this is something on which Montaigne has worked quite a lot, education is one of, um, is part of the problem. When, when you look at the qualification of the workforce and the young people in maths and physics, it has been declining in France over the years. France was among the, the maybe not the best in class, but no, not far from the best in class 30 years ago. And now we are at the bottom of the, of, of the class. And how are you going to innovate in technology if you don't have the workforce uh, to, uh, to do that? So that's a, that's a big issue on which um, it, it's, it's never too late to do the corrections, but you know, we should do it very quickly. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Maybe for the 10 last minutes we have, we could talk about solutions. I don't know if there are some, but maybe to open some, some suggestion. Um, from your point of view, like from US and the French slash European perspective, what 
joint initiatives could France and more broadly uh, Europe, along with the United States, take in the coming months to tackle these major challenges you just mentioned? And could solution be only at the national level or European level, or do they require subnational collaboration? And do you think that multilateral dialogues should be renewed to be rendered more effective? I don't know who, who wants to start. Just one word. Uh, I here I would just repeat what Eric said. Uh, before thinking about uh, the joint uh, dialogue between uh, Europe and the US, it would be good to have some common some common uh, decision made at the European level. But apparently, the, the European countries are are not that good at doing even that. Thank you, Eric. Well, maybe there, there are two areas uh, where uh, uh, some intelligent transatlantic cooperation would be useful. The first one is obvious, it's defense. I mean, we, we were uh, living in a, in, in a dream world where uh, there were no bad guys in Europe, and now we are threatened, including threatened by nuclear strikes, which is just something unbelievable. I hope it would not happen. I hope it's all bluff. Uh, so uh, working together on defense uh, makes a lot of sense, but as always, it's when uh, you know uh, when things change that people change their mind. So NATO is not brain dead. NATO is useful, and and will be uh, even more useful in the coming years. Uh, this is not economics, but you know there are a lot of links between defense and economics. Not only because there is a, a defense industry. That is the first thing. The second thing is is it's it's a bit more. Um, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, it's, it's really on climate policy. Um, okay, we, we have the supply side shock. Um, everybody understands that uh, free energy, it's, it's, it's over. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, <laughs> Europe is, is uh, emitting more CO2 than before uh, because for lack of electricity and for lack of natural gas for the, the gas turbines, uh, we, uh, a lot of countries are using their coal and starting with Germany, but even France is, is as reopen a coal-fired power plant. So uh, this is uh, the good news for the medium long term uh, are mixed with bad news in the short term. Now, my point is where transatlantic cooperation would make sense is about the carbon adjustment at, at the border, uh, which is resisted uh, by everyone. Uh, you know, the, the European Union is trying to put that forward. The idea is very simple, is that the price of carbon should be the same for European industries and for uh, imports. Otherwise, you have to distribute free <laughs> allowances to emit CO2, which is in contradiction with the target of zero emission in 2050. So everybody is against that. I had a, a long discussion with a Moroccan think tank. Uh, three hours ago, and they were very adamant, saying, this is protectionist. You want, you, you guys, you have increased the stock of CO2, which is perfectly true, in the atmosphere during 150 years, and now you are asking us to pay the price for carbon? So please, think, think twice before that. Uh, and and when you explain, okay, uh, so we continue to distribute free allowances, but if we do that, it's the climate policy which is um, which is jeopardized. Uh, it, it's a kind. It, it's a very difficult dialogue. So the U.S. is also opposed, saying that this would be, uh, you know, very classical European protectionism. But this is not protectionism. And in the U.S., there are a lot of people who think that that would make sense to have a carbon price and a carbon uh, adjustment at the border. So maybe if we are not totally stupid, uh, we we could have an agreement. Uh, some sort of agreement which would be a compromise. Of course, that will not be necessarily what Europe would like or the US would like. But look, if you look at things from, uh, you know, from serious, from, from the top, these are the two by far largest markets in the world in terms of consumer spending, in terms of carbon footprint as well. If there is an agreement, even if it's not the, the, a perfect agreement between the US and Europe, on carbon prices and, and, uh, and carbon uh, adjustment at the border, that changed totally the fight against climate change on a global basis because you have the big guys saying, well, if you want to trade with us, you will have to accept that the rules have changed. So uh, this is, uh, I put my hope, uh, but maybe uh, this is a bit misplaced 
on the possibility of cooperation on climate. And cooperation on climate, it's not saying we are going to go to net zero, we are the best. No, no, this is really a, about practical decisions such as uh, the one I've mentioned. Thank you very much, Eric. Maybe for three uh, last minutes before we, we conclude, um, talking about global economy, we cannot avoid um, the question of China. Uh, Pierre-André, you just said a few words about it, but um, um, how do you assess this very varying uh, approach uh, toward China from uh, the US perspective and from the EU uh, perspective? Um, do you think an aggressive economic vis-a-vis -vis China is an effective strategy? How to best manage of shared competition and systemic rivalry with China responsibly? Like in, in, in a few words, both of you. Well, maybe I start. Uh, first of all, China is one of the very few topics in which there is an agreement between Republicans and Democrats, which is, you know, there are not that many of them, but, but China is one. And in general, it's hostility toward, uh, toward China. Uh, in particular, let me rebound to, uh, on, on something that, that Eric just said. Uh, I, too, am um, very strongly favorable to uh, this uh, adjustment, uh, the carbon adjustment uh, for imports. Uh, it, incidentally, I think all economists are in favor of this, and we all know the risk. We all know that uh, it might lead to protectionism, and we have to be careful, and and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the the counter argument, which is uh, the, the the developing country argument, which is uh, will uh, we are we have to pay now for some damages that you guys caused. Uh, the, uh, 50 or 100 years ago. It's very strong, but, but, an, uh, but an, uh, an agreement can be found, a compromise can be found. In particular, what matters is that the price is there, but who gets the, the benefits of the tax uh, is open. And we could think of a price for import that reflects the carbon content, part of the, of the revenue of, of which will be a repaid lump sum to, uh, to, some of the, to some of the countries. The, the, the important thing is not the redistribution, it's really the fact that, uh, that there is a price. And regarding China, I mean, the, the, there are two blocks. If, uh, if the US and Europe agree, uh, then uh, that's a huge way of pressuring China into either adopting the kind of measures that, that would reduce their emissions or pay the price. So in, in other words, it will create a very strong incentive for China to join the movements, which, which by the way, the, let, let's, let's be honest, they, they are moving in this direction as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's economic logic. And, and if for once, for once, uh, economic logic could be the source of decision made by politicians, that, that would be a huge change. Thank you, Pierre-André. Eric, in just one minute, it's a big challenge, sorry. No, no, I, I fully agree with Pierre-André. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's too bad <laughs> that we agree so much. Uh, but <laughs> China is, is also an area where, uh, you know, transatlantic cooperation would make a lot of sense. Well, not only on climate, um, and I agree with Pierre, and, uh, you know, the, the Chinese are, are doing a lot. And, and the reason is not that they want to save the planet. They simply want to save the Communist Party because the Chinese are suffering from climate change very, very badly. And that's why now <laughs> the government is becoming serious about that. No, but it's, you know, on, on, on these uh, delicate issues of defense, on uh, intellectual property rights, uh, on uh, uh, industrial policies, uh, smart industrial policies. Uh, there is a lot of competition between Europe and the US, but there might be some, some area where cooperation would make sense because it would be rewarding both sides. And regarding you know, the policy vis-a-vis -vis China, this was a bit difficult because Germany has uh, an economic model which is uh, very uh, uh, tightly linked to China. I still remember when I was with Morgan Stanley and there were German companies telling me, but you know, I have to produce in China because my German clients are in China. And this is something that the French just did not get, but things have changed since then. And Germany is uh, rethinking, has to rethink a lot of things. So maybe the times are propitious to uh, a rethinking of uh, the linkages with China, which does not mean severing the links. China is at the center of the global economy and will remain at the center of the global economy in my view, but we could be a bit smarter than we are right now if working together on a couple of issues such as IP rights. 
Well, thank you so much, Eric. We just uh, ran out of the, the, the time. So thank you so much, Pierre-André. Thank you, Eric, for, for your time. And many thanks to the Columbia team, uh, always, for organizing um, this first webinar with us. So see you all in two weeks for our second session uh, dedicated to transatlantic relations in the context of the Ukrainian war. And we will publish um, a, a, an article based on our discussion on both Institut Montaigne and Columbia web Website, uh, in the following days. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, and see you in two weeks.